Lowest emotional point you reached during the sale process? The day the wire hit the account. Yeah, it's totally anticlimactic. I was on a commercial uh, flight to, to our road show in Seattle and it um, the wire hit and uh, I was by myself and that was terrible. <laughs> it was really bad. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be with my family and you know, it was, it was tough to, to be by yourself when something that big happens. And then it, it was just exhausting because the, the race was over. And uh, that was a pretty, uh, that's a pretty tough day. Welcome back to another edition of Built to Sell Radio, the podcast designed to help you punch above your weight in a negotiation to sell your company. I'm your host, John Orlo. Today on the show, we're going to hear from James Benham, who sold Smart Bid for seven times revenue. Get this he had no earnout, and he was able to take his employees with him as part of the deal. Pretty cool story. Before we get there, though, just a couple of points. Number one, I want you to go to James's episode page at builttosell.com. There, you're going to get a whole set of references, show notes, definitions of things we talk about today, links to things James references. So make sure you go to builttosell.com to check that out. Number two, I just want to make a big shout out to Rob Nixon. Many of you know, know Rob. He is a legend among entrepreneurial circles, robnixon.com. He recommended James and our best shows, I think I can say with a fair degree of certainty, come from you, people who listen to the show, who hear about entrepreneurs who've sold their company and say, hey, you should really get this guy or gal on the show. So thank you to Rob. If you would like to make a nomination, please go to builttosell.com slash nominate. All right, let's get into James Benham and his episode. Look, as I mentioned in the intro, you are going to learn how James sold his business without an earnout and was able to carve out most of employees and take them with him to his other business. How did he do it? Well, listen for the way he designed his shortlist of potential acquirers once he knew would likely be okay with the deal terms he that were most important to him. Also listen to how he bootstrapped his business. Didn't take outside capital to a large extent, really self-financed the entire business. He also had four or five failures in the very beginning and listen to how he minimized his downside on some of those early products. He also created a steady flow of leads through speaking, so some cool ideas there. We talk about the temptation of sucking cash out of your company in the early days, and he talks about how he avoided that temptation and deciding when to sell his business. Here to tell you the entire story is James Benham. James Benham, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Man, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. So smart bid. I got to tell you a story. So we got some work done in our home and the guy, the GC on the job did an amazing job. Like he is really, really top notch. He's one of these guys has been doing it for like 40 years. And which is why I was so surprised when I got the invoice, it was literally like on a word document <laughs> like that. I think he typed up, you know, like, and and I just laugh when I was reading a little bit about smart, but I'm like, he really needs this product because <laughs> sending an invoice on a word document doesn't instill a tremendous amount of confidence. Tell us about smart, what did this product do? Um, it was, uh, uh, maybe a little earlier than you getting the invoice. Uh, it, it was about bidding. So in 2006, we, uh, had a bidding system for printing companies, uh, so that, ad agencies could bid out their printing work and get bids on from all the printers and nobody wanted to buy it. And a friend of my father's said, Hey, the construction business actually needs a better bidding system. And so we pivoted this print bidding software into construction bidding where a general contractor would buy and use our software to send out invitations to bid to their subcontractors. And uh, the sub would be able to download the plans and the specs and any additional documents or photos, prepare an estimate, and then submit it through our portal. And then 
we, because of our connections uh, at our mothership, JB Knowledge, with the insurance industry, we got into pre-qualification because that became a big deal after the 08 collapse. And so um, we got into pre-qualifying subcontractors. So we knew they were financially qualified to bid on the work. So it became a pre-qualification platform and a bidding platform, uh, but not for residential. We had, we had the only residential that used our platform were big, big, big homes, uh, millions of dollars and up because functionally those projects are so big, they're commercial jobs. And so we, we had heavy highway, industrial, commercial, and super big houses. Um, and we, we had about a third of all commercial construction projects in North America bidding through our platform when I sold it so in cool. 2018. So let me see if I understand. If I want to build a Home Depot and I'm the yeah. GC on the job and I've yeah. got to get uh, you know, a roofing company to do the roof and I got an, an insulation company and framing and like, like these are, it's a huge project. And so huge job. Yeah. each of these sub trades would bid on the job. They'd look at it online and they'd say, okay, it's 20,000 square feet or whatever. And they, yeah. they'd put their bid in. Yeah. Got it. And, and the insurance it's a, it's a, piece it's a, is important. It's a, it's a sealed bid system. It's important to understand that. Um, so the subs, it was not an open auction uh, that, that was tried multiple times uh, in, in the last 30 years and it, it never works out well in the end. So it's a, it's a sealed private bid system. And then uh, when, when insurance companies started cracking down on GCs because subs started defaulting in 08 after the layman collapsed um, and the housing market bust, um, it, it, subcontractors started defaulting and then walking off jobs. And so for, for GCs to get builder's risk insurance and really for them to get surety bonds and for them to get um, SDI, sub-default insurance, they were required to start pre-qualifying subcontractors. And so um, we built a pre-qualification system to make sure they were actually financially qualified to be on the job um, before they were allowed to, to submit a bid. Because I guess there's a lot of fly-by-night operators that, oh, yeah. that oh, yeah. sort of bid on these giant jobs that have no business doing that. So you would, yeah. you would, yeah. your software platform, it sounds, it, it almost sounds as, as I hear you describe it, 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 it kind of a hybrid between a software platform and a marketplace of sorts is would, would sure you agree with yeah. that characterization. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent because we had our own database of subcontractors that the GCs could tap into subs could register and participate subs could bid on jobs. And so we, we introduced subcontractors to GCs as much as we provided workflow tools for general contractors. How did you get the money to start this company? Well, uh, 2001, I was in my dorm room at Texas A&M, the world's finest institute of higher education. And I, uh, I, I, I had, I go Aggies. I had, uh, I had interned <laughs> twice with PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, as a security consultant in their audit division. They offered me a full-time job. I said, I don't want to do that. I want to start my own business. And so I went to my dad and um, I got a, I, he, I got him to participate. He, uh, what he does that me mean, five, participate? He invested? Yeah, he invested a grand total of $68,000. Um, so $5,000 initial investment, a $63,000 loan. Um, and, and then he invested uh, two phone calls a day, plus plus of mentoring me every day for uh, a very, very long time. And then I uh, hooked up with my buddy from high school who was from Argentina, Sebastian Costa. And Sebastian uh, joined on with me in 01 as well. And uh, we started a business. And uh, so the grand, grand sum total net investment was $68,000. We paid the $63,000 loan off in the first two years. And so the total paid in capital was five grand. Uh, and we we boot we bootstrapped this sun gun all the way up. Uh, we started building websites in 01, did custom software in 02, 03, 04. I landed my first insurance client in 04. Then I uh, started focusing on insurance, and then in 06, we had this pivot on the bidding system into into construction. So uh, our service company is called JB Knowledge. The product company was called Smart Bid. They're separate entities. Uh, but certainly we, the funding all came from JB knowledge. Um, you know, it, it generated profit. We used that profit to, uh, to start SmartBid. So sort of you've got JB knowledge, which is doing custom software projects. Yeah. For insurance. Yeah. Got it. 
Got it. And so those margins are fat and good yep. cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you and have you funded. Have, yeah, you have you have good um you know, you you have you have decent margins. You it's always it's a very competitive market because you have a lot of offshore and, and nearshore outsourcers that are in there, but they're 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 good enough for us to invest it. I mean, the reality is um John, that we invested all of our profit for years. Uh, I, I live off. I lived off of less money than I made as an intern for about ten years. Um, so the wife and I ate a lot of ramen and tomato soup and uh, mac and cheese, and uh, took uh, you know weekend trips to to the La Quinta at uh, 14th and Seawall in Galveston for sixty nine dollars for one night because that's what we could afford, and uh, we put all the money, everything we had into uh, building product. What gave you the confidence? Because look, there, first of all, let me just, let me just back up. Uh, Jason Freed, uh, Basecamp, a famous example of doing exactly the same thing, right? Building websites by day and taking all the money and, <laughs> and creating Basecamp as a product. So it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that I've seen work and, and you, you played it beautifully. I guess at some level, as your family matures, like you mentioned, your your spouse, and at some level, there's this temptation to start taking some money out of the company, right? It's like it's like I thought you were successful, honey. <laughs> like you guys are, you know, we, we we built this great business. Why can't we take some money and enjoy ourselves? Like, w- help me understand what gave you the confidence that Smart Bid would ultimately be worth the bet because a lot of people like life is tempting, right? If you're, if you've got a business and you've, you're making money, it's tempting to buy the car, the house, the, you know, but for you, you didn't do that. And and what was it that gave you the confidence that, that that was the right decision? Well, growth rate is everything. And JB knowledge and smart bid were both growing. I, I tried and I guess you could say, failed to grow four or five products before smart bid uh, had smart content smart e-commerce uh, smart intranet smart project smart enterprise you know I, I I can run you through all the and I would spin up a product my dad always told me to make mistakes small so that you could pivot and not lose all your all your belongings and so I would spin up an MVP roll it out to market, but I didn't really understand the most fundamental thing about software, you know, SaaS business building, and that's sales and marketing. Um, you know, I mean, functionally SaaS businesses are, are software financing companies. Um, and you're, you're there to sell, sell and market the financing of this product that you built. And, uh, I, I didn't understand how to really sell and market SaaS. And so, that was a um, that was really where I was learning my lessons. We had some good product, but I did not how to scale it. And with SmartBid, I had worked long enough for the ad, ad advertising industry, building websites for them, that I understood how organic and paid search worked back in 05, 06, 07, way before it was really a thing that the mass market understood. And so when, when we discovered this untapped, I, I'll call it untapped, relatively untapped niche in construction bidding. I went after it on Google and nobody was bidding on keywords. And so we had, we just ran the table for years on organic and paid search and just cleaned up on lead flow. And when I saw our numbers, our first year out of the gate, we had eight customers. Second year, we had 32. Third year, we had 60. Fourth year, we had 100. I mean, it just, it just, it was, it it was bonkers. And so once I saw that the growth rate was going to be there, it was uh, it was definitely a uh, 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 all in moment <laughs> where where you're going. We gotta we gotta put every dime into growing this thing now. Did it create tension in your marriage? Yeah, interestingly, no. Um, I married the right person for this endeavor. Uh, my wife grew up pretty poor. Um, she grew up uh, the daughter of a a teacher, a school teacher, and a professional billiards player, uh, and billiards players, professional unless, air quotes. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll give air quotes on that. Um, and, um, so they didn't have any money. Uh, she was used to stretching a budget. 
it just didn't phase her. And so she wasn't after me for more money, uh, really ever. I mean, it was, it was, I, I kept waiting for that to happen for her to just get fed up with it. And, um, uh, you know, it just didn't happen. Um, well, and I saw it happen to a lot of my friends and family members, you know, that inevitably money becomes the stressor point. And, uh, I was a hardcore, no debt, Dave Ramsey guy. I took financial peace university a long time ago. And my dad was a hardcore, any debt guy. And my dad could have bailed me out by the way, all on the way. I mean, he owned and sold four companies. Um, he had the capacity to give me a salary or to bail me out. And he refused to, and I'm glad he, I'm glad he refused to, because the beauty of business is in the struggle. And if, if he had bailed me out, when I was short on money for groceries, uh, uh, you know, it, it would, it, I wouldn't have learned the lesson. I mean, the reality is we always ate and always had a roof over our head and I'm sure he would have come in and helped me out if we were homeless or, or without food. But, uh, you know, he didn't, he wanted me to learn how to build a sustainable business. And thankfully I married a person who just didn't care as long as, uh, you know, uh, as long as there was, you know, some food. And I told her to ratchet. I remember one time I told her to ratchet it down the expenses and she started cooking tomato soup and ramen a lot. And I, I finally, after four days of it, I'm like, okay, not that much. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 like I've live a little she, honey. <laughs> yeah. And she used to call me at the grocery store asking if we had money for food, you know, and, and she, wow. and she, and she didn't ask me in a way that was demeaning. Um, you know, and I can't remember a single time when, uh, when I, she made me feel bad about the fact that I wasn't bringing money in the door. Uh, I just, I just don't remember it. Got it. So it sounds like in building smart bid, Google search was a uh, organic oh. search was a big driver. It, like, you're laughing, well, like it was, it was the yeah. driver. It was the, I mean, organic and paid search. The other thing that really helped me um, is in 2000 and uh, in 2004 or three, I was selling to ad agencies, website development services. And so I started going to the American Advertising Federation and speaking at local chapters. And it turned out I had a knack for professional speaking. And they started inviting me to speak all over the country and paying me to speak all over the country when I was 24, 25, uh, hmm. running around talking about outsourcing and technology and advertising. And so I, I very quickly had refined some abilities in speaking. And so in 07, when we rolled out SmartBid, I said, well, I need to leave that. And so I stopped speaking to ad agencies that turned down all the offers. And um, I started speaking at American Society of Professional Estimators because that's who uses bidding software. I started speaking and I spoke to almost every chapter they had. I think I spoke to over 40 chapters in three years. And um, I went from having no customers in the room to having half the people in a room every time on SmartBid in about four years. So organic search was all and still is our number one lead generator, paid search number two, speaking number three. Got it. And were there competitors for the product at the time? It sounds like Greenfield, but I'm sure there were competitors. No, no, there were competitors. So the reason we were, the reason we got in was because of a, I would call it a botched M and A deal. Um, a company called I Square Foot, which is now called Construct Connect, which is owned by Roper, which is the company that ended up buying Smartbud. They they acquired a company called Bidfax back in 2000 four or five somewhere around. and bidfax was like the the progenitor right it was the granddaddy of bidding software it was dos based and it would use a fax modem on a computer to to robo dial faxes and transmit invitations to bid unfortunate name for a product in retrospect <laughs> bidfax bidfax yeah. yeah so they uh but they were everybody used them because it was better than standing at the fax machine and dialing all the numbers and then um they built a I think they built a, a Windows-based version, and then they were thinking about web-based, and then they ended up selling to I Square Foot. And I Square Foot, instead of creating a migration path for those those clients, they sent them a notification they were ceasing support for Bidvax, and they needed to migrate. So they they really did like a big bang forcible migration on Bidvax customers, and Bidvax customers were pissed. 
they didn't want to be told what to do. And the, when they looked at the web-based product, they weren't happy with where it was. And so our very first customer was in that exact situation. And what we were able to pull and cobble together in 06 was much closer to what they were used to in BidFax. And because um, it, it, it turned out by chance that what we had built for printing was very similar to the bidding process that BidFax followed just from a workflow perspective. We never, um, we didn't spend a lot of time looking at BidFax. We didn't copy it. We didn't look at it, but we just listened to kind of what their workflow was and said, okay, let's build this. And, uh, and so we, we did. And uh, it sold like hotcakes to anybody who had been on BidFax inevitably would prefer our software. So yeah, there was, there was iSquareFoot, there was Gradebeam, there was, there, were, there was a few pipeline, there were, there were a handful of products, but um, you know, it, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of Greenfield, there was a lot of people using fax machines and Excel spreadsheets. At what point did things start to improve on the cash flow perspective, it sounds like in the early days for eight or nine years, I think in your own words, pretty thin. It, it was pretty thin. Do you remember what changed? Like, was, was there a point which really changed sure. for you guys? Yeah. Well, the first thing, after about three or four years, smart bid started feeding itself because we got big enough that we were able to generate enough cash to pay for most of its own bills. And then at the same time, my outsourcing company, JB Knowledge, we landed some good sized clients in 08, 9, and 10. So it all turned right around um, 07, 08, 09, 10. You know, so you're like seven, eight, nine years into the business when it started turning and SmartBid started being able to, you know, create its own food. And JB Knowledge started generating more revenue and profit. And both those things happened at the same time. The other really important thing is I had been following Dave Ramsey's, you know, debt snowball on my personal credit card debt and cars and house and everything else. And so I was able to pay off all of my debt following his principles before I really made any money. And then I paid off um, some equipment debt we had gotten in the business where I'd taken loans from Dell to buy servers and because, you know, cloud wasn't really a thing yet. Sure. And so... Um, we at the same time we increased revenue, increased profit, paid debt off, and got out of personal debt. And then Lehman collapsed in September of 08. The economy collapsed later, you know, a month later. And then um, we actually saw our first slight revenue decline. But we had so much more free cash flow because we had I I personally had no debt service, and then the business had no debt service, and and then everything started growing again in nine, ten, eleven. So that's really when it that's really when it got better. Are are you starting to as as you go into as you recover from the financial crisis to you know call it 2012 13 14 are you starting to get a sense of what valuation multiples would yes. be and what are you seeing in the marketplace what's your sense Yeah they're pretty low back then um we started getting offers on the business I remember the first offer I got was for balance sheet cash <laughs> because they thought I was like desperate or something. I, I don't remember what it was, but someone, someone really misread my situation and they called me bottom fishing. And I, uh, it was, it was really before now all the PE and VC shops have, um, boiler rooms where they just churn and burn calls and emails and they make everybody feel like the pretty girl to dance. And, they, they've really burned out entrepreneurs on this whole thing where entrepreneurs don't care anymore about inbound calls. But um, at the time that hadn't started in earnest. So I started getting offers on SmartBid um, probably by 20, probably about three or four years in because people saw that we were gaining traction and market share and they wanted it, but they wanted to bottom fish because they saw that I hadn't, I hadn't raised any money. And so they thought I was you know, vulnerable. So they, I, I, my first offer was for balance sheet cash. The second offer was for a little bit better than that. Um, I square foot, I think made two offers over, over a 10 year period before the third one, when we actually ended up selling, we, we sold as part of a process. Um, but, uh, and they were one of many people that were at the table, but that was really the, the, the key thing for us was, you know, just resisting the temptation because I had never seen numbers like that 
um, at that point in my life. And my dad just said, hey, that's nothing. After taxes, that's nothing. You, the, the business is going to be worth a lot more than that. You, you've got to, you got and, and he really helped keep me at bay from um, giving into the temptation to exit early or to, to raise money, both of which I'm really glad I, I didn't do. Yeah, it sounds like that was pretty tempting. So on a multiple of revenue basis, like what were the two I square foot offers that I don't, you turned down? I don't remember. Honestly, I know that we started getting multiples and mind you, multiples sucked um, in 11, 12, 13, but I think we started getting multiples of everything in SaaS, software as a service is, is multiples of ARR in your recurring revenue. No one cares about your EBITDA. As long as it's not too negative, they don't care. They really just want to look at growth rate. And so um, I think it was two or three X ARR was a lot of them. You know, they, they didn't place a and as much value as, as they should have on that, on the business, our growth rate was good. You know, we were in the early double, double, double phases of revenue where you're doubling every year for the first several years until you start hitting much bigger numbers. And then you, it gets harder to double. It gets way harder to double without, mm. in, without injecting a lot of capital into marketing budgets and salespeople that don't always work out. Um, and my dad always had an analogy that, that growing a business is like rolling a ball down the hill. Um, gravity and friction are going to keep that ball rolling exactly at the speed that it wants to roll. And there's only so much you can do to get it started. And, you know, he said, it's, at some point you can't apply more pressure onto the ball to roll it down the hill. Like you have the, you know, total addressable market share, you have competitive forces, you have a lot of things that come into play that eventually you can't influence your growth rate as much as you'd like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're kind of batting away these, in your own two X kind of low yeah. ball at least yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. We had yeah, it was like it was like cash, you know, balance sheet, one X, one and a half X, two X, two and a half X. And we I would have meetings just so I could learn how it went. And but as soon as they started talking multiples, we dismissed it and moved on. Got it. So what changed? What triggered you to want to sell it? Um a, a really good buddy of mine um told me a story. And um it, uh, I, I don't mind saying who, who it was. It's, it's my, this is my story. So I'm not just, I'm not disclosing anything confidential, but, uh, my buddy, my buddy, Rob Nixon, um, told me a really great story about selling a cow. And, um, it, it, it really had an impact. Rob's dad had a prize cow in Australia and it was worth a lot of money, a lot of money. And he got offered incredible sums of money. And this is, I think, I want to say it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in the 1980s. And um, he didn't sell because he was convinced he could get more money the next year and the next year. And um, after he turned down the big offer, um, a few weeks later, the Australian beef market collapsed and the cow was worth nothing. And, um, and he said, James, my, my lesson was that sometimes you have to sell the effing cow. <laughs> and, and knowing Rob, he didn't, he didn't use effing. No, he, he actually extended no. that. <laughs> yeah. He extended that. And, and, um, and I looked at him and I, I, I love Rob, like Rob, Rob is such a good person. Um, <laughs> I can't, I, you know, he really impacted my life. Um, cause I, I joined when I joined my EO forum, I was convinced that I would never sell anything. I was just going to hold everything forever. Because there are those stories. They're few and far between. But once I started visiting other tech companies and visiting private equity groups and VCs, I realized that not all the private equity groups were bad people. Actually, some of them were really great. And not all the VCs were bad people. Some of them were really great. And as a bootstrapped entrepreneur, you, you kind of get this, this island mentality like that it can't be good if it's not bootstrapped. And that's, that's just not the case. I started meeting a lot of people that were really good people that were involved in that. And then I started having conversations around that. And, um, and then I, I, I started getting this feeling like we were probably going to reach our optimal value point because, you know, the, the multiple of ARR is based on growth rates in SaaS. And I started seeing growth go from 50, 40, you know, 45, you know, 30, 35. So it, 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 because we were doing larger numbers, right? I mean, and I, I kept investing and plowing in, but I wasn't getting the, the really crazy growth rates. And, 
And I was like, you know, if I'm really going to spike growth again, I'm going to have to either raise money or sell. And I don't want to raise money because I don't want to have a board. I want to have investors. And um, really the optimal outcome for me was to keep almost all the people and sell the product. Well, there's, there's very, that's very hard to do, you know, and, and, and I didn't want to be an employee of somebody else. Um, and, and so, um, that's why, uh, you know, in 2017, I started a, a process. I found a guy named Andrew Sherman. Andrew actually filed the incorporating paperwork for EO. Um, so I he know was, Andrew. it's funny so, you should mention that he's so, EO long time yeah, guy. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew is one of my, one of my very, very close friends now, um, found out that he'd written 26 books on m a He'd done over 330 transactions. And uh, I mean, he's my Jewish brother from another mother, man. Like, you know, like <laughs> we, like a- and Andrew and I, I, I just love this guy. And um, we connected, he flew down to Texas. And I, for the first time I was like, yeah, I can, I can do a deal with this guy. And we, he picked my brain. He goes, James, you already know everybody. You you already know ninety percent of people that would be potential buyers, and then I'll fill in the gaps, and we'll we'll go target the non non traditional non conventional buyers. And we put together a deck and put together a process because at that time I was getting a lot of inbound inquiries, a lot, and so I knew that I had to either you know I had to get I I had to I had to, I had to do something. Either I had to decide I wasn't going to do it. And just and just hunker down for a long slog out with some some new and old competitors I had because the market got really crowded by this point. Okay, a lot more choice, a lot more competitors. And you're growing roughly thirty percent top line year over year, 2017, 2018. Yeah, uh, sixteen, seventeen, yeah, somewhere around there. 17, and, 16, uh, 17. Sorry, just to be clear, sixteen, seventeen percent top. Line. I don't, I don't remember. It was somewhere around there. I'm giving ballpark. you rough, okay. rough, rough ballpark estimates, and yeah, and great. so we're still growing. Life's still good. We're still making money. We still have no debt, no investors, and and it was just, it was a, it was with with the amount of inbound interest, and with the competitive pressures I saw mounting, and it just it, it looked like a good time that I met the right guy to do the deal with. And, so how uh, many people? How many people did you go to in like did you do the classic sort of teaser, anonymous teaser to sim? Yes. Like did you follow yes. that process through? Yes. Got it. Yes. So how many people on the teaser list at the distribution I, list? I know, it, was, it, was, it was probably pretty big. I mean, it was dozens. It was dozens. And we 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 had, I want to say we had about a dozen people express interest back. Got it. And and signed and then, the NDA and got the sim. Yeah. 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 And of the dozen, how many sort of Submitted put together an offer. Yeah. I want to say four or five put okay. together good, good offers. And then there was a little bit of a bidding war and um, then we now, got it, got it to where we wanted. Yeah. I want to, I want to explore the bidding war before I do that though. How did you treat, because you were quite um, quite clear in your own mind, I believe preceding yes. this process that you didn't want to be someone else's employee. Correct. You wanted to keep, uh, JB knowledge separate. Yep. You yep. want to keep the employees. Yep. Now, did you t- telegraph to, or did you communicate that to the potential buyers that those were your hard lines in the sand, or did you wait further into the process to reveal that information? Well, I, 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 I waited because you never know. I mean, what if someone presents something to you sure. that's a non-traditional, I, I didn't know what all the structures were going to be like. And so I knew I wanted to to be able to retain control over things. I knew it'd be very challenging, and I knew that would probably rule out private equity buyers. Right? Um, I had to I had to Why? find a str- well because the only people that would let me keep all the engineers is a strategic who wanted me out of the way or already had their own engineering teams. <laughs> you know the the private equity guys they're they're buying a, a cash machine and the cash machine doesn't run without the people and they don't have like a spare team to throw in. Um, a strategic would be the only real one that would give me the deal structure I wanted. And so I, I had to discount any interest from private equity groups pretty early because I just knew that um, that their multiples wouldn't be as good. And that ended up being the case and their deal terms wouldn't be as good. And that ended up being the case. Yeah. No, I, I know before we hit record, we talked about whether you could share the, the, the sale price. And I know you cannot. And so Correct. if my listeners wondering 
why hasn't he asked James about revenue? The reason I haven't asked you about your revenue is we want to talk about multiples of revenue. And obviously, if we reveal the revenue, then it's easy to back into it. So, uh, at, so at, at this point, you're uh, like, how, how, let's not use revenue, but how big are you in terms of num- like number of employees or number of customers, like some proxy for? Yeah, well, we, no, I, 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 I talk publicly about customer counts. We had, Receiving bids, we had a quarter million companies receiving invitations to bid and bidding on on projects. We had 1,143 paying clients. Um, that's weird uh, that you can remember that. Like uh, that's a weird, uh, uh, weird, uh, no. weird thing to remember. How do uh, you remember that? I, I, I don't. Well, I I, I I really liked all of them. Um, <laughs> I, I had, so had eleven hundred customers. I had I had I had one hundred and forty three of the top four hundred in the world used Got us. It. So we Got had it. a bunch of large enterprise deals. We had built the software to scale and work well for large multi billion dollar contractors. And, and how many so, employees like it, it dedicated to this product, like the smart bid product? Probably like say? sixty or something. Sixty or so. Okay. Got it's, it. You know, the, you when it when you have a. When you have a multi-company strategy, you have some shared overhead, and that's why sure. I, I say or so because you know you you the outsourcing company outsourced to the product company, and and so you end up with some shared shared allocation. And so, so what was your reaction to the four offers that came in? Uh, I was excited. I mean, uh, what what other reaction is there when you you know it's going to be one of, one of your bigger sales you've ever done, and. Uh, you know, you you put together something. You wonder if people are going to submit. I'd heard countless stories. I still hear countless stories of people running processes and and getting nowhere with it. Um, I hear stories about that all the time. And so, you you certainly wonder if 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 all the people that say they're interested are actually going to be interested once they get the sim. And uh, of course, the, the reality is con- confidential information memorandum, but basically a book about the business with all the details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was uh, it was exciting. I was very nervous about whether or not we'd actually be able to execute a transaction, and um, but you know, it, it 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 like I thought it would. It came down to strategics, and the strategics had some good serious offers, and you know, they bantered back and forth. Obviously, it was a not not a public bid, um, but. Um, Those- those you know. four offers, can you share kind of range multiple of revenue, uh, kind of low end to high end? No, I don't. I don't. Um, they were all in a very close proximity because we ended up selling for like 6.8 times ARR, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, and after all the deal got done, it probably ended up being about seven times ARR, annual recurring revenue. And um, they were all in the neighborhood. The The real differentiator was the deal terms, right? What happened to me and what happened to my team? And that, that was the big thing that I was concerned with is what happened to me, what happened to the team. And how did the offers to treat those two things? Well, they're very different. And the one I picked ended up being the one that gave me the best terms that I, that I wanted to have, which was, you know, the, the ability to keep my engineering staff, the ability to keep um, my um, support staff, the ability to um, for me to not have to go work for the company, those the, the for my partner to not go work for the company, that was the big um, the big thing that I was really focused on. It's like the dream exit for so many entrepreneurs. So you, oh, you want, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, deal terms are everything because they either put you in handcuffs and your team in handcuffs, or they um, or they liberate you, right? I mean, and in this case. I, I care. I care a whole lot about my people that work for me, and if we were going to sell this asset, and I believed, and and I ended up being right in this case that it was the right time to sell, because after I sold, some other acquisitions occurred that ended up making it very hard to compete in that space, and so the time I ended up in this case, I ended up being correct on timing, and. Um, it would have been bad for our business and bad for our teammates. So the best thing for me and the best thing for the teammates in this case ended up being aligned, you know, that um, it was the right time to, to move on from this for us. That, what was your dad's reaction to the four offers? What advice did he share with you? 
He, he just always told me to have your number in advance, you know, just have your bottom line. And so he made me go through a process of having the bottom line before we went into it. What questions did he ask you in order to arrive at the bottom line? Didn't. He, my dad is remarkably simple in his advice to me. I, I, one, one time I asked him how he dealt with, dealt with the stress and anxiety of building and bootstrapping a business. And he responded back, I just don't think about it. <laughs> I was like, that is not helpful, father. Um, so in this case, he just said, you just need to have your bottom line. Like how much, how much is it going to make it worth, um, you know, giving up this thing that you love? Because I loved SmartBed. I still love it. And it's still doing well in the market. So, but it's, um, you know, we didn't, from a multiple perspective, others sold for higher multiples. Other venture capital backed businesses sold for higher multiples than we did. Right. Like, and I'm okay with that. Um, they had to give up a huge portion of their deal proceeds um, to, and they got, you know, they got crushed down on their cap table. They had liquidity preferences. They had, you know, multiple investor groups and you, you can go through a bunch of deals where they sold for higher multiples. And well, there, there's, there was a construct tech recently, a construction technology company that sold for 25 times ARR 25 times. And so like you, you end up like wondering, and you know, we had, we had competitors that sold for 13, 14, 15 times ARR. And you just can't get, get hung up on it. Like, and my dad always told me that too. Like, you're going to do a deal when it's done, move on. And, and it's, it's over, like you get it, get over it. Right. Um, and that was definitely the case. Like, I don't care about those other deals. Those weren't my deals. And those, that wasn't my cap table. You know, my cap table had no outside investors on it. So it's just you, you and know, Sebastian and your dad. And my, yeah. So it was like, what's the, what's the, um, you know, I don't care. I don't care what their multiple was. I don't care what their deal size was. I don't care what their deal terms were because it, it's not my company. It's not my deal. This was my company. This was my deal. And it was the best thing. And, and if you look at the last four years of JB Knowledge and our new products that we built and our teammates, this was the best thing for us and the team. It allowed us to focus on insure tech. It allowed us to um, capitalize on a massive investment. We didn't, we had plowed a lot of profit into this business. We had to get it out at some point, right? We either had to get it out through cash flow, and we, we ran it at break even in the last years, you know? Mm -hmm. We had to get it, we ha it had to come back at some point. Otherwise, it wasn't worth it. And so um, I was, I was, I was happy we sold. It was the right time for us. It was not nearly as high as some multiples I'm seeing now. I, I don't care. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting emotion that you get. I'm, I, I loved the product that I, I miss talking about it. Um, but I love my new products even more, you know, cause it's, 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 it's our new thing that we're doing. Yeah. It's we a new start, shoddy, yeah, yeah we, sure. we start, we started a new product called Terra claim and it's, it's really starting to take off. And we took, we started, we took a product that we already had smart compliance and we've, uh, we've, uh, almost quadrupled the size of smart compliance since we sold smart bid in 2018. How did, so, how did the acquirer deal with your non-compete? Uh, well, that's why I, I've stayed out of the construction bidding and estimating space. So that yeah. it was confined to that, that category. That I, I don't want to talk about getting into specific deal terms, but, but I, I, it's, there's a reason I stayed out of construction, construction bidding. You know. Got it. Got it. Are you ready for a quick lightning round of questions before we wrap? Sure. Yeah. What was the slimiest trick a prospective acquirer used in trying to buy your business? <laughs> oh, that one's going to be a, that, that'll be a, a, a tough one. I think I had some, I think I had one that that really led me on to believe they were going to submit a serious offer and they drug as much information out of me as possible and ended up acquiring um, a, a competitive company. And that felt pretty slimy. Um, and, and, it, and it looked and it, and it appeared that they had been talking to them for a long time. And so um, I think that's probably a, a more common tactic is people while they're, while they got a real serious one on the hook, they initiate an MA process with all the competitors so they can gather as much competitive intel as possible before their main deal is announced. 
that's probably the the one that felt the worst. Biggest mistake you made personally in the process of selling your company, selling SmartBit? Um, I probably should have over communicated the process more to once we announced it internally, I should have over communicated more to my team. You know, it, uh, I, 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 we follow EOS in our company, uh, entrepreneurial operating system. And they say you have to repeat things seven times. I feel like like during an M&A process, you have to repeat it 17 just to make sure everybody understands what's going on and who's where and, and um, what's going to happen. Cause it's, it can be really traumatic to people, even though they're staying, they still want to know what's happening. And even, you know, nobody lost their job in this transaction, right? Like we had a, we had a few people that had to go with the company. Um, it was a small group of folks. Um, and you know, we, I negotiated handling that to make sure they were okay. And then I had my team and everybody was set and nobody lost their job, (laughs) but it was, it was still very, um, traumatic for them. And, and, um, and so I, I, I could have communicated better. Lowest emotional point you reached during the sale process? The day the wire hit the account. Yeah, it's totally anticlimactic. I was on a commercial uh, flight to, to our road show in Seattle and it, um, the wire hit and uh, I was by myself and that was terrible. <laughs> It was really bad. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be with my family, and you know, it was it was tough to to be by yourself when something that big happens. And then it, it was just exhausting because the the race was over, and uh, that was a pretty uh, that's a pretty tough day. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's oftentimes it's the highest point for a lot of people, but in your no. case, what was the highest point? Um. Probably when we like inked the, the 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 letter of intent, and I, you know, I got the the, the signature that they were going to buy it, um, because then the due diligence process. There's all this excitement about due diligence and telling people there's a lot to do. You know, by the time the wire hit, we, we had consummated the deal. We'd signed everything. Everybody had been notified. We'd done public. You know, we had done publicity. But it was the it was the thing that really matters, right? Like it was. It's you got the money. Um, but the most exciting thing was, was, was definitely like inking the deal and, and, um, you know, agreeing to, to sell to these folks. And, you know, they've been competitors of mine for years. In fact, um, w- you know, we'd had a pretty tense competition. Um, but the stat, the, the other, the uh, other side CEO and I had always kept a good relationship, uh, individually. And that really helped get the, get the deal done. Um, uh, when that, when it got tough. He and I got on the phone with each other and we, we sorted it out, um, which was really cool. So yeah. it was, yeah, the most exciting thing was getting the deal inked, the, the most anticlimactic. And, and really, I, I had a really hard time for a few months. Was, it started when the, when the wire hit. Yeah, yeah. Were there any resources that you turned to, books, conferences, uh, anything that you could point to that helped you learn about the exit process? Um, so Andrew has written... 24 books on m and I want to say. Um, I think one of his best ones is called Harvesting Intangible Assets. That's a really good, good book. Um, other than that, I really leaned on EOS big time because EOS talks about, you know, the, the business life cycle and this being part of it. And so we just really clung to EOS and our methodologies and our three-step process documenter and all that. We really clung to that. So. Yeah. 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 Last question, then I'll let you go. What trophy did you buy yourself? I think I know the answer to this, but what did you buy yourself to celebrate and commemorate this win? Uh, 2001 uh, Piper Saratoga 2TC. Uh, nice. It was a, it was a, a six seater. Um, it was about a 17 year old plane. So I got, you know, I believe in buying used assets. I don't buy anything new. Um, but um it was a great airplane. I, I built a lot of hours in that. Um, and um, you carry, you're saying it past tense. What happened to it? <laughs> oh, I, I, I sold it and bought something bigger. 
So <laughs> what do you have now? Uh, we'll, we'll keep that on reserve. Uh, all off right, the podcast. All right. <laughs> what was the, what was the range on the Saratoga? Oh, uh, well, I think 600 miles or so. I, I, I would only, I would only fly at about two and a half to three hours comfortably. And it would, fl- it would cruise at about 175 knots. Um, and, um, but so I, I think like the actually the full range was, but you would, you would never fly it that far. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I bought my dad's old Piper Aztec from him and that has extended tip tanks. I still have that plane cause it's been in our family since 1976. And on that one, I can fly that plane for about seven hours without stopping. Um, and, um, that's, a uh, that's my. Um, that's my, I, I call it the, it's, it's the ass truck. So if I want to, if I, if I, I do a lot of dog rescue flying, so I fly rescue dogs around to get to their forever homes and I'll, I'll pack the Aztec full of dogs and, and then go take, take them to their, their forever home. And that, that that's paints the, a hell of a picture. Yeah, it's fun. I got a lot of pictures of it. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I've flown, I've flown, uh, probably over 50. I want to say now it's probably over 70 dogs, to their forever home. I'm doing another rescue flight tomorrow. Um, bringing a dog from Austin down to Tampa tomorrow. Uh, he got pulled out of a rescue shelter. So good for you. Good for you. Yeah. And you've got a book, a book coming out. Tell, tell us where to find that, what that's about. I know your time is precious. So just a quick hit on. on yeah, the book. sure. Uh, you can go to jamesbenham.com, sign up for more information. The book's called the bootstrapped entrepreneur. So it's, it's about all the lessons I learned in, in bootstrapping. I'm not, I'm not uh, the most successful bootstrapped entrepreneur ever, but we've had a good run of it. And I thought it was good to, to write it all down and, and uh, also talks about how to, how to bootstrap innovation at large companies. I think that's a skill set that's been long lost. And so um, I, I pulled a bunch of case studies from people that I've worked with over the years on how to take a large company and bootstrap on a budget. So you're not always at the till of trying to raise more money from your internal investment committee. So we, uh, we talk about that at the Bootstrapped Entrepreneur, but my website is jamesbenham.com. Um, that's awesome. jamesbenham.com. The Bootstrapped Entrepreneur is the book. Thanks yeah. for doing this, James. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad to be on. Hey, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with James Benham. For show notes, including everything we referenced in today's episode, the Dave Ramsey course, the Andrew Sherman book, Rob Nixon's website, just go to built to sell Dot com. We also include definitions for some of the lingo and acronyms we use during the show. Again, builttosell.com. While you're there, consider nominating a guest. As I mentioned in the intro, James was a nomination from Rob Nixon. So if you have someone who you think would make a great guest, please nominate them. Again, builttosell.com slash nominate. If you're wondering how you can support the show, a review on your favorite podcasting platform is the very best way you can get back to the show. So please consider that while you're there, hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Today's episode was produced by Haley Parkhill. Special thanks to Dennis Labataglia for handling the audio and video engineering. And thank you to the entire community of certified value builders who help us bring our message to you. My name is John Warlow, and we'll talk to you next week. 